So let's see, uh, uh, Kepa, I have uh, uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, thanks so much to the, to the commentators. Um, I'll tell you a story uh, about Dagfin. It's not really about Dagfin, it's about me. Uh, I went, uh, this is how I, the branch of the Follestall Name Notion Network got to my brain. So I, I went to a little college in the Midwest, or in the, in the Great Plains, we should really say, Doan College, where the philosophy curriculum consisted of Plato, Aristotle, and Paul Tillich, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a few people like that. Um, but along about my junior or senior year, I realized there was more to philosophy than I was being taught, and I discovered... Um, Wittgenstein, so uh, I went up to the University of Nebraska where O.K. Bausma gave a seminar on Wittgenstein. So it came time to go to graduate school, I went to Cornell because there you had Max Black who had been Wittgenstein's uh, student in the, in the early days after, in the 30s, and then uh, Norman Malcolm, Black and Malcolm were the same age, but Malcolm had gone over um, after World War II and been Wittgenstein's student in the late days, and so it was just a great place to study Wittgenstein. But after about a year, I was sick of Wittgenstein, and I had gotten this book by Quine, same book that inspired Dogfin, but second edition, from a logical point of view. And there, in the foreword to the second edition of From a Logical Point of View, this great man, Quine, says he owes so much to his graduate student, Dagfin Fudestal, who helped him prepare the second edition. And I thought, Jesus, that lucky son of a bitch. Here I am toiling away on the philosophical investigations and, you know, in the middle of New York State. And he's over there at the foot of the master learning, learning about the cutting edge in philosophy. And, and then I quickly remembered of something Bowsman had told me that, that at Harvard they eliminated about half the incoming class and at Cornell they didn't. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe I made the right decision after all. <laughs> so it was a great thrill to later uh, meet Dogfin at Stanford. And um, in, the, in, the, um, in the written version, I do talk a bit about a bit more about the, the the particular theory I have, the name notion network, which is, uh, you know, some related to all these other ones going back to Geech, uh, as Dagfin quite properly points out, the uncredited uh, source in his article, The Perils of Pauline, about uh, of many of these things. Um, now, Dagfin often makes a point that, well, how's this going to work with respect to uh, future events, and more particularly with uh, mathematics? Uh, we refer to mathematical entities, but uh, how, how is that going to work? And in the, in the article, I said, well, you know, I don't know what numbers are, um, and I don't know how one thinks about numbers, but however, the first person who thinks about a number thinks about it, he can pass on information about that number, uh, with a name. Now that's not actually the way we usually think about numbers. We usually think of them in Arabic notation so that, so that the notation we use for a number does, uh, does involve a, a sort of a description that identifies the number in a unique way. But there are some numbers like pi for which there are just names. I mean somebody, Archimedes or somebody, uh, thought about the ratio of the circumference to the diameter and he, he gave it a name, pi. And uh, that's been passed down, and people can talk about pi and ask about pi without having any idea what pi is. If a student says, well, is, is pi the ratio of the diameter of the circumference or the, or the radius of the circumference? He's asked a question about a certain number, even though he can't identify that number uh, in any systematic way. Whereas if he said, is, you know, 245 larger than 240, you'd think, well, Something's wrong with you, kid, because uh, the way you're referring to it contains the information that it is. But I said, uh, in, in so far as we need a theory of the transmission of information about numbers via names, uh, 
the name notion wor network seems to work for something like pi, uh, although it doesn't tell us exactly how the thing got started. And I would say the same with future events. I would say my term origin is a very bad word for uh, a name notion network about a future event, say, uh, what's a good future event? The, uh, the uh, what is it when Jesus comes back to judge the quick and the dead? The apocalypse, right? <laughs> so the apocalypse has been talked about for quite a while under that title, and it's possible to talk about the apocalypse without knowing exactly what what's involved in the apocalypse. Is, he, is that Jesus judging the quick and the dead, or just the quick judging the dead, or the dead judging the quick? Or I don't quite remember what it is, but I know it's bad and it's coming. Uh, so the apocalypse wasn't the causal origin of talk about the apocalypse. At least I wouldn't have thought so. But once the chain got started, I think the name notion network idea works pretty well. Now, mathematical mistakes are, are another different and interesting issue. And, and Johannes uh, reminded us, or didn't remind us, told us, explained to us the, the, how many dimensions of, uh, of uh, uh, possible worlds are, uh, you'd need to really account for all the different ways in which things can be false, and thus all the different things that are required for them to be true. And when you get into someone, say, I'm, I'm balancing my checkbook in the old days when you had to do that by hand, and I typically made mistakes, so, uh, you know, I have a $245 balance, I write a $100 check, and I have a $345 balance or something like that. Um, how, do you, how do you represent that mistake. How do you represent what the world would have to be like for my equation 245 minus 100 equals 345 to be true? Um, well, I mean, possible worlds uh, in which 245 less 100 equals 345, there aren't any. Right? So that's not going to help. But also what I, so the level of O content doesn't help. Also what I call the level of S content doesn't help because uh, 200 and 45, uh, no matter who says it and when, stands for 245, and the same with 100, and same with 345, and there's just no possible world in which the object that plays the 245 role uh, minus the object that plays the 100 role uh, equals the object that plays the 345 role. But as Johannes points out, some people have, have gone a step further. Notice that you can have the same notation uh, with, uh, with different meanings, uh, some of the same constraints but different meanings. So if, if you throw away 9 and 10, you can have, uh, you know, this uh, uh, 1 through 8 system, and that is used in computer science. And if you weren't sure whether uh, a particular equation was supposed to be true in base 8 or base 10, uh, that would correspond to uh, a reasonable set of possible alternatives, but they would be alternatives at roughly what I call the level of E content. That is, um, uh, th it would be the connection between the, uh, the symbols in the representation and, uh, and the roles to which they were assigned as opposed to differences in which objects played the roles. So uh, the whole issue of information and mathematics is very interesting, but this also connects in a way with what Francois was saying. I mean, uh, you might be able to get at uh, what the world would have to be like for 245 minus 100 to equal 345, not in the sense of what numbers would have, how they would have to be related, uh, nor even uh, what would have to, uh, uh, how, how things would meet the, the requirements that the Arabic numeral system uh, base 10 places on, on uh, numerals 245, 100, and 345, you'd have to look at uh, 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 rather drastic alternatives, of which would be widely and all over the net, about how, how meanings might have been assigned to the digits so that those things could come out true, or meanings assigned to the minus sign or the plus sign. Now that set of worlds is not something that one believes when one makes a mistake. I mean, it's an, it, I think it's a perfectly kosher, if I may use that term, notion of content, uh, but, but it's, 
it's, it's an elaboration, a development. It, it's, it, it's like you start with weight. Weight was a perfectly fine notion for people for thousands of years, and then somebody says, no, you really need to distinguish weight and mass because the weight uh, varies from altitude to altitude, and, and, and you need something that doesn't vary from altitude to altitude. And, uh, and, and I'm sure people said, well, why don't you just not carry heavy objects up hills and the whole problem wouldn't arise. Um, but it's an extension, but it's not weight. It's something different than weight that we get at something that contributes to weight. And so similarly, these new notions of content I see as generalizations of a folk psychological notion of content. Uh, but the folk psychological notion of content is what our, our term believes is, is born and bred, so to speak, to operate with. And when we get away from that and just use the word believes for any old kind of content that uh, we think is involved in what's traditionally called belief, I think that's really um, obscures things. There's several things that go into that. Um, like Dagfin, both Stalnecker and Lewis were students of Quine, and they inherited a lot of his insights or prejudices. Neither of them liked to think about the mind as a very structured thing, full of ideas and impressions and things like that. Uh, they both, uh, they both, well, I, I speculating about Stalnecker a little bit, but Lewis really saw the end, I mean, what he, he started with this notion of folk psychology. Now, to me, folk psychology means, well, you know, you had a bunch of people, probably pre-linguistic, develop some concepts for dealing with other people's minds in terms of, uh, of what they thought the world was like. And these people probably, uh, well, they didn't have language, they so, uh, or they didn't have much language. Uh, they interacted a lot with the objects they taught about. They didn't fly and read books and so see things on TV and so forth and so on. So these cases, like the Hesperus Phosphorus case, I mean, that's, that's pretty unusual. I mean, the Babylonians saw Hesperus and they saw Phosphorus and they were indeed seeing the same thing, but they didn't know about it. It was, it was an uncommon case, right? So the concept of content was not developed with the twin earth and arthritis and H2O and XYZ and uh, San Sebastian and Donostia, it, it, it's fairly clear that the notion of content was developed uh, long before the Spanish started giving new names to, to uh, old Basque places. You just, so, so the idea of O content, well, what, his mental state is adequate if the world is in a certain way. How are we going to describe the world for the purposes of indirectly describing his mental state? Well, just the objects and what properties and what relations they have, that works perfectly fine. So that to me is the er notion of content. And then if you want to understand folk psychology, you have to understand how that fits into more refined notions of content in such a way that you can solve what I regard as the fundamental dilemma, how episodes can have both content and causal role. And I, but Lewis thinks that if you push your study of folk psychology enough, you'll end up with decision theory. Uh, and that, that just seems to me, uh, that's just an idea I don't connect with. But Stalnecker sometimes says the same things. And for decision theory, you really, you really want to have all the different alternatives laid out in the various columns and the various matrices. And I just don't think that's how our ordinary notion of content works. Um, I really appreciated a number of things uh, Francois said about the defense of my view against others and an explanation of how, of how these components, uh, if you go back to the 60s, things seem completely different. And things like Fodor said that now seem, I would think, quite bizarre, uh, uh, didn't seem so bizarre. Um, and, uh, uh, but I have been influenced by Stonic. I originally thought, well, you need belief states and the contents, and, you know, you could define these other concepts, but you don't really need them. But now, you know, now I, I think you, you do need them. But you don't need them as replacements. You don't need diagonal content as, 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 as some kind of an all-purpose remedy that does all the different work that uh, you could do. Uh, instead, you should have this concept of what I call an ionist condition, as I explained, uh, 
Uh, there's just different purposes. You can carve up the space of, uh, 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 of things that could work out right or could work out wrong in terms of the truth of a, of a belief in different ways for different purposes. And so that's the way it is. Um, so uh, I think Stonecker had a point uh, about the difference between Kaplan and I, and I don't think I understood it when I talked to Kaplan back in the 70s, or, or he understood it, and that explained why we often couldn't figure out what the other one was getting at. Um, uh, he's, he refers to causal chains uh, and such things as pre-semantic. They're involved in setting up the semantics. They're not part of the semantics. And he, in, he, he inclined to, I think, think the same thing about, about context and characters, in a way, even though his own work, as far as I could see, showed exactly the opposite, you know, that these were part of the semantics. Semantics for indexical language is the whole system of context, character, and content. It's not just the relation between the expression and the content somehow mediated by this other apparatus, which is somehow pre-semantic. I mean, I think that. Uh, Kaplan showed that in the case of indexicals, the mechanism of reference is part of the semantics, and my idea has been, yes, and you should, you should extend that to the case of names and so forth and so on, well, but you shouldn't do it in a way that confuses uh, the content which is what is believed uh, with the other uh, uh, parameters of success that your work discloses and systematizes. So that's my view about that. I thought Isadora's presentation was lovely, and I thought that what she said about time and the disanalogy of time and self-knowledge uh, was exactly right uh, and, and bears a lot of thinking. Uh, I am trying to write a book on free will and so have been thinking a lot about time for the last 10 years mostly to no avail. I mean, um, nobody, I mean, uh, the whole thing is really discouraging, right? The physicists tell you there is no such thing as time, and, uh, and by the way, they're late for a meeting, so they can't talk to you anymore. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to make about that. And then uh, uh, presentists think that only the present is real, and I can't make any sense out of that. The growing block theory appealed to me for a time, but I mean the past isn't real in the way that the present is real. The past is real in the sense that there's some abstract object that was made true, and it's still available us, for us to think about, whereas the present, and I don't think the future is symmetrical with the past. Even Dummett talked himself into this in his last book, but he's... Oh, he's definitely wrong. I don't know what to think about time. Uh, I think if I don't believe in some, some sense of open future, then there's no point in worrying about determinism because, you know, some sort of fatalism is true. So I don't know what to think about time, but I think endlessly about time. I, 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 I think I believe that the world consists of things happening, and that's it. Uh, but how to... How to how, how to make sense of the whole thing is baffling. So I think there are analogies between the self-knowledge case and the knowing it's now and the flow of information and so forth, but I agree with Isadora that making the analogies requires a lot of a hypostatization about times and dates and so forth that isn't needed in the case of persons. So I uh, appreciate you all very much uh, coming, and now uh, we should have some time for general questions for both me and, and uh, uh, preferably for the commentators. Well, I want to tell a Francois story. So Francois invited, Francois and Pierre Jacob invited me to come to CREA, as the Institute Jean Nicot's predecessor was known. Because uh, uh, Francois thought some of the stuff I said on indexicality wasn't too stupid. And I said, I'd love to do that. She said, well, you have to write a little proposal. So I wrote a little proposal, and I thought, well, they're in Paris. I should say something, you know, shows I'm open-minded about philosophy. So I went and 
drag my eyes across an essay or two of Derrida and then told some lies about how fascinating this was and I couldn't wait to get over there and learn more about it. And by return mail, I got this thing from, from Francois without much, you know, no, no spare words. Eliminate all of that, please. <laughs> Sincerely, Francois. So it w that was a great relief, and, and I never I never had a single conversation with, about, or in any way connected with Derrida the whole time I was there. So that was great. Manuelo, yeah. This is for Francois, actually. Um, so it, it may be right that the two um, frameworks, the Louisian and the um, Perian or whatever, are equivalent at the end of the day, that they are just notational variants. But you may, it sound as if they were exactly the same, and that obviously cannot be right. I mean, on uh, this not a tissue content, the way you call it, on the Louisian view is a property. It's not a traditional proposition. Uh, and on the, on the alternative uh, picture, it is not. Uh, now, people uh, seem to think that this is, these are differences because, for instance, uh, John and uh, Ernie Sosa in the 70s, they took this not a tissue contents to be characters which are property-like, but then they changed their mind. For, uh, John, for instance, has this postscript in which he thanks uh, Stolnecker for at least uh, letting him uh, see that this not a tissue content should be a traditional proposition, a diagonal proposition, or a token reflexive proposition, whatever. Uh, so this is a reason. This makes one thing that people take them to be different pictures. Maybe at the end of the day they're uh, equivalent, but this is not obvious. You yourself <laughs> emphasize the virtues of thinking of the not at issue content as properties. You argue for that on the basis of that uh, it is, it's supposed to have advantages on accounting for epistemological aspects like uh, immune to error through misidentification. So we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't make them to uh, look too close. Maybe they are, but this is a, an interesting thing to find out about. Do you have a question for Francois? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I agree, if you look at what people say, there are many differences. For example, many people say about Lewis that he has only one level of content, so you have at least to rephrase his framework to show that there are actually two. And in the case of things, whether they are propositions, so John prefers proposition to property, but I think that in many cases it would be better to use properties but to say exactly the same thing. I think, as you say, at the end of the day, we can rephrase all that into a single framework that sort of uses insights from both, but, but there are those superficial differences. And, uh, and there is this important difference between the sort of the primitive cases and the, that, the, what John talked about, that is the case in which, for example, you have the thought that uh, concerns yourself only in this primitive way, and other cases in which it's really a thought that it's about yourself, in a, in, that is, the, you deploy self-concepts and that's part of the thought, and that's something much more sophisticated that involves this pooling of information. So that, I think, is an important phenomenon that has to be captured. Now, Lewis can also capture this distinction by, by saying that there is the case in which the subject simply is there in the point of evaluation, but there is the case in which the identity relation is actually built into the property that is primitively self-ascribed. And that would be sort of a, that would be a way of maybe getting the same the same distinction. But ultimately, also another thing I should do with uh, respect to Lewis is to move from his central world framework to a multi-central world framework in order to not to have to be the, an asymmetry between our relation to ourselves and our relation to the other objects around us. So there are all sorts of uh, differences that are sort of important, but not at the end of the day, as you said. So I, I'm sympathetic with what. Both of you said, I mean, Lewis at some point says something like, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by Perry and my system is really a, a sort of a terminological variant and if, if my system is right, his has to be right. Uh, it's just more complicated than required. That was thrilling. I mean, one of the great philosophers of the, of the century uh, is influenced 
even in any way by something I say, and even thinks there's a kernel of it that's right, was, you know, uh, tremendous. But then, you know, what he does with it, uh, it kind of puts my nerves on edge. I mean, self-location is involved, is locating oneself in logical space, which is a set of causally closed universes, which for some miraculous reason, things only happen there if they're possible here and vice versa. <clears throat> so I have, uh, you know, but so, so first of all, cut away all uh, modal realism. Uh, cut away the counterpart theory. Uh, uh, that's, that's not essential to a lot of what Lewis says, but it's essential to a lot of his metaphors. Uh, and I, I think they're mostly not very helpful. Uh, the other thing is you need is there's, is there's a basic difference about the use of the word belief. And David and I talked about this. I said, well, belief is a, is a very special attitude. It usually involves concepts and so forth. You can't, you can't take every, what I would call a prodoxastic attitude, like know-how or primitive self-knowledge or knowing where. You, you don't call those all belief. That's not the way it works. And he said, I, I do call them all belief. You know, I, I countenance no such distinctions. It was partially connected with his, his kind of view of the mind and ideas and impressions. He, he didn't want to have a, anything to do with most of those things or even representations. Um, then you have to deal with the footnote. Uh, footnote says in, in uh, they dictate what they say. It says it's unfortunate in the study of belief has been confused with the study of the semantics of belief reports. This has foisted much confusion. I just find that incredibly remarkable. I mean, coming at it from a folk psychological point of view, what is folk psychology? Folk psychology is our way of talking about beliefs and so forth. That is the clue to folk psychology. And, if, and so you can't just say, Oh, belief isn't, you know, that clauses are very misleading as to the true objects of belief. Something's gone wrong there. And notice he doesn't use the word content. So uh, to, uh, to me, you have to start with uh, folk psychology uh, that sees uh, that clauses as getting at the primary things we use to classify, classify this phenomenon called belief and work from there. And he just, he doesn't have contents, uh, he doesn't have representations. He just has this one thing that I can hardly disapprove of because it's what he got from me, which are these centered worlds or properties or, as I call them, roles. So, but then to call the relation we have to those beliefs, uh, that just seems to me wildly wrong. So, yes, I think Francois is right. There is a, there is a core theory that if you cleared away all the terminology, uh, w would be uh, w would be the same, but I think you're right that all that terminology is, is invested in a lot of methodology and expectations and so forth and so on that are very uh, uh, key in philosophy, and in particular uh, in situation semantics, the most important concept is probably constraints. We see constraints. Uh, that is how the how the how the world works uh, as first being uh, 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 many and partial and not just one whole system. Uh, secondly, having to do with the world and not having to do with relations with other possible worlds. Uh, and secondly, being a great source of relativity in the application of notions. That is when we use counterfactuals, uh, when we when we talk about how things must be. There's always some you know some subset of constraints that are relevant to that. And if you ignore that, and suppose you can get by with this kind of holistic uh, notion of uh, 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 based on what things are like in most similar possible worlds, well, I'm not saying that's crazy. How can I say it's crazy when such bright people believe it? But it's really a lot different. Uh, so from that point of view, I would have reservations about what Francois says and side more with you. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so this is also a question to Francois. Uh, it, 
It concerns the uh, Austinian propositions that you have uh, four on your handout. Those are the things you call Austinian propositions. So these are ordered pair of uh, an individual uh, and uh, a centered proposition, centered world proposition. Um, and so I was wondering where, how you um, view this in relation to the um, problem of the unity of the proposition, or one of the things that have been identified as the problem of the unity of, pro of the proposition, namely that, that um, propositions uh, have their contents essentially or are identical uh, with their contents. One doesn't need anything external uh, to get from the proposition uh, to the content, but with these ordered pair things one does um, because it's not obvious what uh, the relation should be between the one entity and the other in this pair in order to get uh, a truth value. Must be some function that is external to this ordered pair. So I, I, I was wondering, I'm sure you have thought about that and what you have to say. So, yeah, I think that <coughs> it's the same problem indeed as the general problem of the unity of the proposition. So I would say that those are the pair that they are not the, the, the Austrian proposition, they are representation. I mean, I use those other pair to represent what I call the, the Austrian propositions uh, first. And we could use, I mean, I could use other things to, to represent them. I don't particularly need this way of uh, representing them. And as far as the Austrian proposition, I think it's like the propositions in general, you have this indeed problem of the unity and uh, one particular way of uh, looking at this problem which I like is the sort of uh, idea that propositions abstract from acts of predicating basically properties of objects in the case of uh, standard propositions. And in the case of Austinian propositions it's very much the same thing because I think of for example, this primitive self ascription thing as, as being a f form of predication in which you predicate the, say, the relativized proposition or the property of a situation that's externally given or something like that. But there is, I think, of a, I like the approaches. I mean, I, it's not, of course, uh, I mean, if you're skeptical of those approaches, it's not the proper time, and uh, so I'm not an expert on that. But I like the approaches that might be described, I mean, might be uh, classified under the heading of cognition first. So there are those acts of predicating things of objects or predicating properties of situations. And propositions are the content uh, what, of those acts, and therefore they are abstraction from the acts in question. And then the, the, this raises all, all sorts of issues that, of course, there can be propositions even if no one has ever performed the acts, but that those are the traditional uh, issues in this area and people have come up with attempt, uh, attempted responses to this problem. So I think that talking about Austinian provision or classical provision doesn't very much change the, the issues with respect to the unity problem. Barweiss and I used to fight about Austinian propositions. I don't quite remember why. But it was connected with unarticulated constituents and the idea that propositions should be kind of upwards persistent. And, and uh, um, that is that a, that a proposition or whatever you call it that was true uh, in a situation should be true in every larger situation. And he thought certain uses of definite descriptions and certain other things um, suggested we should we should do away with that, and I said no. You should bring in unarticulated constituents and preserve persistence. And I know that Francois likes Austinian propositions, but I'm not sure he likes them for the bad reasons, in my opinion, that Barwise likes them, or for good reasons. 
Yes, uh, you know, both uh, John and some of the others in the discussion are bringing in David Lewis. And I think that David Lewis is usually brought in because he had this uh, view on possible worlds, which is rather extreme. <laughs> and uh, but there are glimpses there, which I think reflect a more interesting view. And I think these really come partly from Husso and partly from Bolzano, because David Lewis took my course on Husso, and he. Uh, that course started with seven lectures on Bolzano as background for Husso. And he wrote this term paper on Bolzano, a very good term paper. But if you combine these elements from Bolzano with some of the insight in Husso about the self and so on, you can find glimpses of that in David Lewis's approach. But it is so overwhelmed by all these things about the, all these possible words which is really not very satisfactorily defined even by David Lewis because he talks about one word being more similar to another than others. And that whole uh, notion of similarity between possible words is very, very bad, <laughs> very full of problems that he doesn't deal with. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, my picture of David, uh, which is full of admiration and, and friendship over a long period of time, but. Uh, he was taught by Quine that, that the world was a desert landscape. And then he got to UCLA and discovered how great possible worlds were. And so he combined these views, right? There's an infinity of desert landscapes. Um, my view is there's one world and it's not a desert landscape at all. It's just teeming with properties and relations and all kinds of stuff. Johannes is having heart spasms, but <laughs> there are there are these stories in philosophy where 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 people have two heroes and they try to bring them together. And I, I can't say that Lewis didn't do a brilliant job, but um, at Oxford uh, you had you had uh, Dama who worshipped Frege, and uh, then you had Davidson show up, and then you had this generation that tried to combine Frege and Davidson, and McDowell and, 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 and Evans when he allowed himself to be influenced by McDowell. Um, and I don't know, it's, uh, it's, uh, these are uneasy combinations and it takes great ingenuity to bring them together. Uh, is the ingenuity well spent? Well, probably in David Lewis's case, yes, I'll keep quiet on the other. <laughs> I just wanted also to say something about um, um, uh, Francois. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> about Francois' um, comments because um, he talked about mm, Stalinger's objections, and then the idea was that uh, he was providing a, a, a reason why he thinks that the objection doesn't really threaten um, John's theory, and you know. The, the way I see it in, in Frege and Demonstratives and in the problem of the essential indexical, John made this distinction between the what is believed and the way is believed, the what is expressed and the way in which it is expressed. Later on, he introduced these new notions of content. That happened in Cognitive Significance and New Theories of Reference, a paper that I love, as you may recall. <laughs> and. Um, and, and and I I myself remember because because I don't like the kind of of conception that Stalnaker and Lewis push. I recall being rather upset about that paper because I thought, oh my goodness, now we're going to have all these kinds of content and that kind, those kinds of content we're going to be back to the old picture in which you have all these relationships to that content. That, and and I was thinking of content that, that the traditional substantial way the what is believed, the what is expected, and so forth and so on. And I remember John saying, no, 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 there's no reason for, to think of this this way. I'm just using content as a very useful apparatus to classify things. So I can classify mental states by appeal to, the, to content. That doesn't mean that the individual has this attitude towards the content. 
that to me seems an advantage because, you know, when I reminisce and, 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 and think about John Perry teaching his classes in, in, at Stanford, what I'm reminiscing about or remembering or believing has to do with John teaching his classes and not with that man called John Perry. Mm. That's not the thing I have the attitude towards. And I think that that's an advantage. In any case, it seems to me that if one takes seriously Stalnaker's and uh, Lewis's theory and they find them advantageous, just saying that John also has all these notions of content is not going to help him get out of the objection. I mean, it's still going to be a threat if you think that it's a threat. I don't think that it's a threat, but I don't think that that's the way because their conception of content is considerably more substantial, of those contents, is much more substantial than John's. At least that's the way I see it. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I'm less sure about Stalnecker, but I'm yeah, uh, and because and my picture goes back to situations and attitudes, which isn't much read anymore, but there, there we had this concept of indirect classification, right? And so you, you, you have some situation type that applies to this part of the world, and then you have a constraint, uh, and you say this part of the world relative to that constraint gives us a way of describing that part of the world in this indirect way, and that's what content is all about. It's, it's not this attitude towards these abstract objects, it's a system of classification based on uh, constraints, and that's the heart of folk psychology. So, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe if everybody read situations and attitudes again, the world would be a better place. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be the last question, if nobody says the contrary. Yeah, so it's just a tiny comment on um, Isadora's uh, first point on self-knowledge. Um, th there's one thing you said that I thought could be understood in a, in a slightly uh, misleading way, so I just wanted to see if you could clarify a little bit. So at one point you said um, that, the, the, that John Perry's approach to self-knowledge had the advantage that he, it was uh, naturalistic and, and it uh, sort of um, uh, did without uh, a sort of special notion of the self. And so I wasn't sure exactly whether that was the right way to put it because um, in the Perry framework to pull the information from normally self-informative ways of gaining information and um, other informative uh, ways of gaining information, we still need something like an I notion or what Francois would call an ego file, for example, um, to go from, for example, uh, it hurts to Marie's in pain. There has to be some sort of transition via I am in pain. So I'm not sure exactly in what sense we, we, we are in a situation where we can do away with an I concept. And I think it's probably not what you wanted to say, but so I, w I, w I, w I was wondering whether you could just clarify a little bit. Um, and then I just had a tiny, tiny remark on the stuff about dolphins and chimps and, and computers um, and whether creatures that pass the mirror test uh, have or do not have self-knowledge in, in the sense that interests the theorists of self-knowledge. Well, I don't know about computers and I don't know about dolphins, but apparently chimps anyway um, have some sort of grasp of their own mental states, or at least so the distinction between that and others' mental states because they're able to do things like, for example, deceiving um, others, lying uh, in a certain sense. So I don't know. I mean, that's probably not so clear whether we can say so confidently whether chimps and dolphins don't have the interesting kind of self-knowledge. Anyway, yeah. Short answer, please. I'll just shortly answer the second one because uh, I didn't mean to claim that they don't have uh, um, that sort of self-knowledge, but uh, like the point was rather that it is quite plausible and theoretically at least possible that you could have knowledge of oneself without uh, self-knowledge in this other sense. And as for the first point, I think it's John who should uh, reply like whether 
you need a special notion of uh, self and how special it is. I mean, so the, like when I was talking about the advantages of your account, so, and you stress that a lot in the paper is this idea that um, like you don't need to appeal to any fancy entities like the Cartesian ego. So, um, uh, and Mary was wondering, uh, Mary, Marie was wondering whether that's really the case or not. Uh, it, yeah, it, my view of the self is uh, the self is the person. Person is um, a live animal, and that's all we need. Then we have all kinds of interesting conceptions of the self that are very important. You know, self knowledge, self. But anyway, so so yeah, I regard the naturalistic deflationary view of the self as a, as an advantage. And uh, are we coming to a close here, Keppa? So I, w I would I would uh, really like to thank Keppa. Hosu, did I, get, did I get that right? Uh, Maria, where's Maria? Maria, Ma there's Maria. Larates, uh, Jesus Marie, who has made Basque philosophy and its flourishing possible. All the commentators, and last, Inyaki the ant, who gave his life that this conference might proceed. So let's give them all a big round of applause. Did I forget anybody? Well, just two little, just two little remarks. One, uh, we are now posting there the uh, map for the restaurant tonight. We want you to be there like 8.30, right? Yeah. Or 8.45, no, not, not later than 9.00. You won't be admitted later than night. <laughs> than nine, it's in the old town. Uh, it's called uh, Morgan Berria, right? Morgan Company. Morgan Company. Morgan and Company, or something like that. Now, um, to finish this thing, uh, this is being streaming, as you know, has been been streaming to all over the world. So, um, <laughs> well, but you have the technology to have a nice family picture. So, would you please come here? and stand all together so they take a picture of us to say goodbye to the world from Donostia, please. <laughs> <Thank you>. Yeah, <laughs> we can sing a song, <laughs> please. Our MA students are a bit shy, but they should come here. Aida. Otherwise, I will, I will say your names once. <laughs> so you want to know the, the word for, for goodbye in Basque is agur. So you can, let's see. <laughs> agur, agur. Yeah, okay. Agur. Agur, Eskari Casco, that's it. That's it. Good again. Rolando? So we say Agur. 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 <laughs>